Welcome everyone to the today's SimSip scientific webinar series about uh, the PPK models of antibodies in pediatrics and pregnancies. Before I'll introduce our speaker of today, I just would like to say a couple of things. So first of all, this session is recorded and the recording will be made available afterwards. All of uh, you are muted. So if you have any kind of question, then please write it in, uh, type it into the, the, the chat box. We will have time for question and answers at the end of the session and uh, we'll read out then the, the, the question to Kate. Uh, or you can also alternatively raise your hand and we can unmute you. And uh, you can ask your, your, your question directly. And with that, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Kate uh, Gill, who um, will present today in this webinar series. So Kate did her uh, PhD in pharmacy at the University of Manchester about uh, UGT metabolism, started at Satara about 10 years ago, uh, developing populations, developing uh, monkey models, developing diverse set of compound files, working with therapeutic proteins as well as small molecule drugs, so a whole lot of experience in different fields. Uh, three years ago, she joined the consultancy team uh, to have a more of a pl application of PPK models. And I'm very glad that she will present today on the modeling of antibodies in, in, in children and pregnancy. And without stealing any more of your time, Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you, Felix. OK, good morning uh, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, so as Felix said, today I'm going to talk to you about using PPK models to predict exposure of monoclonal antibodies in paediatric uh, and pregnant patients. The current status of where those models are and the opportunities and current challenges they face. So pharmaceutical companies are legally required to consider studying new drugs in paediatric patients, but approval of MABs for paediatrics has generally lagged behind that of adults and is often only granted for older children or adolescents. So in 2018, only 20 of the 68 licensed MABs by the FDA were also licensed in children, and often that was only in children over six or even 12 years of age. So ideally, we'd like to streamline the process of getting the treatments to children, particularly young children, quicker. In terms of uh, PK for monoclonal antibodies, they tend to have a higher clearance and volume per kilogram of body weight than adults uh, in children, and so require higher weight-based doses to maintain the same exposure as adults. And so it's not as easy as determining a dose per kilogram of body weight and using that across the entire age range. In pregnancy, most monoclonal antibodies are contraindicated and uh, the advice is to stop taking them before uh, conception. However, there are situations where monoclonal antibody use in pregnancy is warranted. For instance, inflammatory diseases and asthma, which are highly prevalent in, or sorry, can be prevalent in women of childbearing age, are associated with negative pregnancy outcomes and or reduced fertility. So continuing treatment to maintain disease remission can outweigh the risk to the fetus. In addition, stopping treatment with monoclonal antibodies and these sorts of diseases can lead to an increased use of small molecule drugs like steroids or methotrexate, which are also linked to negative pregnancy outcomes. There are also other disorders like lupus, antiphospholipid syndrome and Hashimoto's disease where the mother produces autoantibodies that cross the placenta and can cause severe complications in the fetus, including um, thyroid dysfunction, fetal cardiac block or even death. There's a set of treatments being developed at the moment called the anti-FCRN monoclonal antibodies, which are designed to disrupt this transfer of autoantibodies across the placenta and protect the fetus. So this is an indication where monoclonal antibody treatment is um, going to be a benefit to the fetus and would be, need would be needed in pregnancy. So we need to determine what a suitable dose level would be in a pregnant woman. In terms of PK, there appear to be inconsistent changes in exposure 
um, in gestation. And also the amount of monoclonal antibody that's transferred across the placenta is different for different antibodies. So this means that we need really careful consideration as to what dose level is going to be suitable. A clinical trial is usually required to determine the, um, the correct dose for paediatric or pregnant subjects. Um, but it can be difficult to recruit these subjects and there's a whole raft of ethical issues that go along with that. We need to ensure that the dose level that's given is going to be therapeutic as well as make, making sure that it's going to be safe. And so modelling and simulation, including physiologically based PK modelling or PBPK, can be used to help bridge the gaps and optimise clinical trial design and determine a suitable dose, particularly for the first in um, paediatric doses or for the first studies in pregnant women. So last year, my colleague Dr Hannah Jones and I reviewed the literature to look at the current status of PBPK modelling for monoclonal antibodies in these sensitive populations and what the opportunities and challenges are. And I'm going to spend the rest of this presentation talking to you about the data that we collected for our review article um, and also um, bring to your attention a couple of new things that have been published since. So for those who aren't aware or need a, a refresher, I'll just give a brief overview of PBPK models for monoclonal antibodies. So the figure on the left shows a typical full body PBPK model where each of the tissues is given its own compartment. And these are linked together by blood flow and for large molecules like uh, monoclonal antibodies are also linked together by uh, lymph flow, which drains from the tissues and returns back to the venous blood. You can have minimal PPK models where the tissues are lumped together into a single or more limited number of compartments as well. Monoclonal antibodies are too large and polar to diffuse through the uh, cell membranes. And instead, most of the distribution into the interstitial space is uh, down to convection through pores through the endothelial wall. And so this is a slow process. And so we model the disposition using uh, permeability limited models. And you can see the three compartment substructure on the right hand side that is usually located within each of the tissue compartments. And so we model the vascular space, the endosomal space and the interstitial space. As well as convective movement, the uh, monoclonal antibodies can also reach the interstitial space through uh, endocytosis and transcytosis across the endothelial cells. While in the um, endosome, in the endothelial cells, the monoclonal antibodies can bind to the neonatal FC receptor or FCRN. This binding occurs at low pH in the endosome. And once bound, this protects the monoclonal antibody from degradation and catabolism in the lysosomes. Instead, the monoclonal antibodies are returned to the vascular side of the endothelial cells or the interstitial side and are released from FCRN because binding affinity is lower at physiological pH. And this recycling mechanism protects them from elimination and leads to the long half-life and slow clearance that we typically expect from monoclonal antibody. In addition, endogenous IgG also binds to FCRN, hence its very long half-life of 20, around 21 days. And you can have and you have competitive binding of monoclonal antibodies and endogenous IgG for FCRN. We don't usually see the impact of that on MAB-PK unless you're giving very high doses or you're in a disease indication where you have very high levels of endogenous IgG. Monoclonal antibodies are also designed to bind very tightly to target receptors um, and they are eliminated um, through, bind, through this process. And this is called target mediated elimination or target mediated drug disposition or TMDD. You tend to see the impact of this at low doses where uh, monoclonal antibody concentrations are low and clearance is non-linear with dose. As your concentrations of antibody increase at higher doses, the target receptors become saturated and then your clearance becomes linear with dose. <laughs> 
So to develop PBPK models for um, monoclonal antibodies, we need to understand the physiological processes affecting their disposition. And to extend those models to pregnancy or paediatrics, we need to understand the ontogeny of these processes or the changes through um, gestation and fetal development. So this table comes from our review article. There's a lot of information on here, and I know the text isn't very big. I'm not intending to go through every single point. What I want to show you here is that we looked in the literature to see what um, on data were available to describe the ontogeny or um, gestational changes in the physiological processes that are important for determining MAB disposition. And, to, and then we've categorised those data into whether there were human data available to describe the changes. And you can see in the far right column that for many of the processes, we do have some human data available. For those processes where we don't have animal, sorry, we don't have human data available, in some instances there are animal data, which can be used to inform PBPK models. And unfortunately for some processes, there is still no data available. And so what I'm going to do over the next few slides is just to talk about some of the data um, that we looked at. Uh, I'm not going to go through every single uh, piece of physiological data, as I said. All the references are in our review article if you want to look in more detail at anything. Um, also to note, I'm not going to talk about things like blood flows and organ volumes, those aspects are already well reviewed and covered in um, PBPK models for small molecules. I'm going to focus on the physiological processes that are more specific for monoclonal antibodies. So firstly, paediatric. We didn't do an extensive review of the literature ourselves um, for paediatric data because there were a, a few very good review articles that had been published um, in the past couple of years. And there's a couple of references given at the bottom here. Extracellular fluid volume decreases following birth um, and plasma volume increases gradually. There's also approximately a threefold higher extravasation rate in neonates compared to adults. This is due to multiple factors, including the fact that neonates have a high capillary density in tissues like the skin and the muscle, and they have a higher uh, surface area to volume uh, for the skin than adults do. In addition, the proportion of the body that's made up of leaky tissues is higher in neonates compared to adults. So these are tissues like the liver, the spleen and the kidney, which have sinusoidal capillaries and relatively large gaps and, and pores through the endothelial wall and allow greater distribution of monoclonal antibodies. In addition, lymph flow is uh, higher in neonatal animals compared to adults per kilogram. Unfortunately, there aren't any human data available, but this is an instance where we have animal data that can help to inform PPK models. And so all of these processes together lead to a higher volume of distribution per kilogram and also a faster rate of distribution or a faster rate of absorption following subcutaneous or intramuscular administration. I mentioned that we have competitive binding for endogenous IgG and monoclonal antibodies to FCRN. So we may also need to consider what's happening to endogenous IgG levels. The data on the, in the figure are taken from Panatal in 2020, when endogenous IgG concentrations uh, from infants and children of different ages were collated from the literature. And the red triangles are the mean values from groups of infants, at, uh, groups of children at different ages. So at birth, um, endogenous IgG levels are similar in the newborn to adults. And this comes mainly from placental transfer of maternal IgG, and I'll talk about that more later. After birth, there's obviously no more IgG coming from the mother, and maternal IgG is gradually eliminated from the newborn. It takes a little while for the neonatal synthesis to catch up, and so you get an initial decrease in endogenous IgG levels, reaching an adir around three months of age. And you can see that in the inset at the top of the figure. 
Then the IgG levels increase gradually up to adult levels by around 10 years of age. So FCRN is obviously important for determining the um, elimination or the protection from elimination for monoclonal antibodies and the long half-life. Ideally, we'd like to have absolute abundance data for FCRN in each of the tissues and know the ontogeny for each of those, much in the same way as we would for uh, enzymes and transporters in small molecule PPK models. However, the data are very limited. Um, and although there are data from other um, measurement techniques, they're often conflicting. So when we wrote our review last year, there weren't any protein abundance data available in um, paediatric humans. Um, however, there are some recent data that were published this year by Barbara et al, where they measured the protein abundance in the liver of FCRN in the fetus, in children of different ages and in adults. And you can see those data shown on the right hand side. They found that there was a significantly higher FCRN abundance in the liver in neonates, infants and children compared to adults. However, there aren't any data, uh, protein absolute abundance data available for other tissues currently. The uh, preclinical data from rodents uh, with measurements of mRNA abundance and um, Western blotting data tend to show uh, an increase in FCRN abundance in some or all tissues following birth. However, the profiles are highly fluctuating and it can be difficult to discern what the ontogeny is. You may also need to consider target levels um, and how these are changing with age or how they change between different disease indications. The availability of data to um, determine ontogenies for targets will depend on the target you're looking at. So for, for some targets, there may be no data available. For instance, um, erythropoietin receptor, there's no data available. Whereas for other targets like TNF-alpha um, or IL-6, there may be data available to determine the ontogeny. And so, whether there are data available needs to be assessed on a target by target and potentially disease indication by indication basis. So now to talk a little bit about pregnancy and what data are available. Here there weren't, we couldn't find any review articles um, that had already been written for physiological uh, parameters that are specific for monoclonal antibody exposure. So we looked at the literature and tried to pull together as much information as we could find. Firstly, to look at endogenous IgG and how that's changing in pregnancy. The figure on the top left shows the maternal IgG concentrations. The solid line is the concentration in a non-pregnant healthy adult. And the dashed lines are the standard deviation around that mean value. And then the open circles are concentration data for individual mothers. And the closed circles are, are mean or median concentrations from groups of pregnant women. You can see that there's generally a decrease in endogenous IgG concentrations in trimester three. This is most likely uh, due to the increases in plasma volume, but also could be contributed to by the loss of IgG across the placenta to the fetus. So to look at fetal IgG, those levels are shown in the figure on the right hand side at the top. Here again, the black line, solid black line is the concentration in a non-pregnant adult um, and the circles are the fetal IgG levels. When we were looking for this data, I was expecting that we, we would find it hard to find data from the fetus. And so I was pleasantly surprised that there's actually quite a bit of information available. The earliest data we found was at 13 weeks of gestation. And so you can see there that the concentrations of IgG in the fetus are very low. They then increase through pregnancy. Um, so by 28 to 32 weeks, the concentrations are about 50% of those in the mother. 
And at term, the concentrations are uh, similar to a non-pregnant adult. So there's a rapid increase in IgG levels in trimester three. Almost all of this IgG comes from the mother across the placenta. And it's been estimated that in cord blood, only 0.2% of the IgG is from the fetus. Because we have increasing concentrations in the fetus, we get an increasing concentration ratio between the fetal and the maternal IgG levels throughout gestation. And these data are shown in the bottom left figure. Here, the black line is the line of unity where the concentration is the, the same in the fetus and the mother. Um, and the data here are for matched um, uh, baby and mother pairs. So the concentration ratio increases um, in line with the increase in fetal IgG. And by week 35, the concentrations in the fetus and the mother are approximately the same. And then by uh, term, you would expect to have higher concentrations in the fetus than the mother because of that decrease in maternal IgG in trimester three. Um, and in an average infant at birth, at term, you would expect approximately 50% higher IgG concentrations in the fetus than the mother. Following birth, the mother's IgG levels return back to non-pregnant levels around four to six months postpartum. So we know that IgG and potentially monoclonal antibodies are transferring across the placenta, but how is that happening? So the fetal placental villi have continuous endothelium with similar to the heart and the muscle with pores of around six nanometers in diameter. And this allows molecules of approximately 65 kilodaltons to, to transfer through. However, monoclonal antibodies and endogenous IgG have a much higher molecular weight of around 150 kilodaltons. And so there's little convective transport of them through the placenta due to their size. Indeed, other immunoglobulins like IgD and IgE are also too large to transfer through the pores. And so there's no, there's no transfer of those across the placenta. For IgG and monoclonal antibodies, instead they're transported uh, by endocytosis and transcytosis via binding to FCRN. So again, FCRN abundance is important. Um, and similarly to paediatric data, the absolute abundance of FCRN in the pregnant women, the fetus and the placenta are very limited or, or not available. There are uh, some recent fetal data. I showed a couple of slides ago about the paediatric data from Barbara et al. Uh, from earlier this year, where they'd measured the absolute abundance in liver tissue um, in children. They also measured the abundance in fetal liver. And the concentrations, uh, also the abundance was not significantly different between the fetus and adults. However, it didn't indicate in the paper what gestational uh, week the fetus, the fetal tissue was from, uh, unfortunately, and there aren't any data available for other tissues or to delineate the changes through, if any, through gestation. In terms of the placenta, uh, there aren't any protein uh, absolute abundance data available, but there are mRNA and staining data from human and rats. And you can see the figure on the right hand side, which is from Lozano et al. in 2018, where they measured FCRN expression uh, in placent human placental tissue from groups of women in different weeks of trimester three. And there's a gradual increase in the FCRN expression, which is consistent with that increase in endogenous IgG transfer to the fetus during trimester three as well. We talked about lymph flow for pediatric, um, pe sorry, pediatric uh, subjects. Uh, to look at that for pregnancy, there are no human maternal or fetal lymph flow data available um, 
this is not surprising for the fetus. I don't know who would um, volunteer their unborn child to have lymph flow uh, estimates taken. Um, however, in the lack of human data, there are some animal data that we can use to inform PPK models. So in pregnant animals, we've shown that lymph flow increases to the uterus in trimester three and to the mammograms in lactation. And in fetal animals, lymph flow has been measured to be five, approximately fivefold faster than in adult animals. So this is even faster than in the neonatal animals. You can see the table on the right from Bellini et al. in 2006, where they tabulated some of the left thoracic duct lymph flow uh, per kilogram of body weight in the fetus and the adult animals. And you can see that the values are higher in the fetus. To mention, I'd like to mention TMDD again here. So there could be changes in target abundance throughout pregnancy. Indeed, um, TNF alpha levels have been shown to decrease during pregnancy, and there have been instances of spontaneous disease remission in pregnancy as well. So you may need to consider whether there are changes in, in target abundance and how that's going to affect TMDD clearance in your uh, pregnant woman. There could also be target located in the placenta, uh, and this could impact the transfer of monoclonal antibody across the placenta to the fetus. Um, I'll come back to that a little bit later, um, but it it, it means that you may need to consider target levels and how they're changing in the placenta. And you could have target in the fetus itself. Uh, and so the development of that uh, may need to be considered. For some targets, obviously, there, there may be data available. Uh, for others, the data is likely to be limited. And so again, this needs to be considered on a target by target basis and in the pregnant woman, potentially on a disease indication by disease indication basis. So we looked um, early last year at the current status of PPK models in paediatrics. And at that time, there were seven publications detailing PPK models designed to predict exposure of monoclonal antibodies in paediatric subjects. And the references are shown here. I looked again a few weeks ago to see whether there'd been any further work uh, in this area, and I was pleased to see that there were another three publications um, that have all been all come out in the last year. Um, so there's clearly lots of work still going on in this area. Of those 10 publications, there are PPK models described for 11 different monoclonal antibodies, which is shown in the figure, uh, and IVIG. For some of the monoclonal antibodies, there's more than one published model available. You can see for infliximab and palivizumab, there are three different published PPK models in the literature. Uh, I think the reason for this is likely because of the availability of clinical data to verify the models with. There are more clinical data available for infliximab and palivizumab, and so those are the antibodies that people have tended to, to um, look to when uh, developing the PPK models in paediatrics and uh, showing a sort of proof of concept. From the publications, the prediction accuracy of MAB exposure in paediatric subjects was uh, generally within twofold of observed values for both PK parameters and uh, plasma concentrations. Some of the models only included verification with data from older children over maybe four years of age. However, good prediction accuracy was also reported in the models that had verification with data from neonates or even preterm infants. So there's a publication by Malik and Eddington where they developed PPK models for three monoclonal antibodies and IVIG uh, designed to predict exposure in preterm infants. And 90% of the plasma concentrations were predicted in within 1.5 fold of observed values. So prediction accuracy seems to be good across the entire age range. Six of the publications also predicted population variability, not just the 
concentrations in an average uh, individual. And again, the prediction of population variability had, was reasonably successful. Most of the publications have used commercial platforms like SimSip or PKSim, uh, which you can see as the blue shaded area in this pie chart. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, publications where they've used user-built software such as R and uh, SAMI as well. All of the models include ontogeny of some processes. So generally ontogeny is incorporated for things like blood flows, organ volumes, body weight, all the, the sorts of things that are already incorporated routinely into uh, pediatric PPK models for small molecules. For the um, physiological processes that are more specific for monoclonal antibody disposition, um, ontogeny was incorporated for some things like lymph flow in all the models, but the way it's been incorporated differs between the models. So one model incorporated a uniform scalar for children under one year of age. Another couple it used allometric scaling for lymph flow. Both of these resulted in a higher lymph flow in neonates compared to adults in line with the um, preclinical data that I showed before or I mentioned before. Some of the models assign lymph flow as a percentage of blood flow and so the ontogeny is going to follow the same ontogeny as the blood flow. There are other physiological processes where the ontogeny uh, isn't incorporated for all models. For an example of this is for the um, extravasation rate um, or capillary surface area, which is uh, partly governing extravasation rate. Ontogeny for this is only incorporated in a couple of the models. Um, and part of this is the fact that the data to determine that ontogeny is limited. Most of the models incorporate competitive binding to FCRN, so they model endogenous IgG simultaneously to the monoclonal antibody of interest. But the ontogeny of the endogenous IgG is only considered in approximately half the models. This is going to be more important when trying to predict the exposure in very young children, uh, where the endogenous IgG concentrations are changing more rapidly. The authors of the publications tend to agree that FCRN is abundance is a really key parameter. And uh, an area where we're currently lacking um, information. One publication did try to account for ontogeny of FCRN uh, through fitting of clinical data for bevacizumab and then used that fitted ontogeny to predict exposure of another monoclonal antibody. And they showed an inverse correlation between FCRN concentration per kilogram and age. PPK models uh, can be used to uh, incorporate continual maturation of physiology. So this is where a subject, say, is uh, of two days old, is dosed with your monoclonal antibody, for, which may only be dosed every three or four weeks for, say, three dosing cycles. And so the physiology of the simulated infant is going to be very different between the start of the simul tri simulated trial at two days old and the end of that simulated trial at three or four months old. And so this can be accounted for in the PPK models where the physiology of each simulated child uh, progresses throughout the simulation as well. Um, and about half of the publications incorporated uh, this into the PPK models. Again, this is something that is more important when trying to predict exposure in very young children when physiology is changing rapidly and may not have as much of an impact when you're predicting exposure in older children and adolescents. We also looked uh, in the literature to see what the status was of PPK models for pregnant patients for monoclonal antibodies. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to find any published models to date. Um, even when I looked again a few weeks ago, I couldn't find any. I think uh, the 
Part of the reason for this is the fact that there's very limited clinical data to verify uh, models for pregnancy for monoclonal antibodies. Uh, most of the data that are available are for the anti-TNF alpha monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and for the next few slides, I'll just show you the data that are available if we had um, PPK models for pregnancy for monoclonal antibodies. So first, the data to verify the exposure of monoclonal antibodies in pregnant women and what, what changes are occurring in gestation. So adalimumab and etanercept have been have shown uh, no significant changes in exposure throughout pregnancy, whereas infliximab had an approximately a threefold increase in exposure in trimester three, and vedolizumab had an approximately twofold decrease in exposure in trimester three. So the effect of pregnancy on the antibody exposure appears to be antibody specific. It's worth noting here that the number of subjects is low. For etanercept, for instance, this is a single case study, and these are not usually controlled trials, so the women are often receiving different uh, dosing regimens uh, to each other. There have been some suggestions in the literature as to why we see a different effect of pregnancy on the exposure for different monoclonal antibodies. Infliximab binds to the, its target of TNF-alpha. And I mentioned that in pregnancy, it's been reported that TNF-alpha levels decrease. And this would lead to a reduced TMDD clearance and an increased exposure of infliximab. However, adalimumab also binds to TNF-alpha. And so you may expect to see the same effect on adalimumab exposure in pregnancy. The suggestion for why there's a difference between infliximab and adalimumab is that it's due to adalimumab being dosed subcutaneously. In pregnancy, many women move away from dosing in the, the region of the stomach to other parts of the body for subcutaneous administration. And there are also changes in fat distribution during pregnancy. And potentially, these are affecting absorption of adalimumab. Uh, which may be masking any effects on the changing TNF-alpha levels on TMDD clearance, and the net result is that there's no difference in exposure. There could also be changes in anti-drug antibody formation. Uh, these also lead to uh, clearance of monoclonal antibodies. And so if the levels of anti-drug antibody change, this is going to affect the clearance of your monoclonal antibody during pregnancy. However, there's very little data available at the minute. There are also data in the literature for the uh, MAB concentration in newborn infants and mothers, uh, which has been measured at birth in term at babies. And so the concentration ratio between the newborn and the mother can be calculated and has been reported. You can see the data that we managed to collate from the literature in the figure here. So the blue line here is the line of unity where the concentration was the same in the newborn and the mother at birth. And the grey bars represent the range of concentration ratios that have been reported in the literature for um, individual mother and infant pairs. Again, the number of subjects is often very low. Um, they're not shown here, but they are in our paper. Uh, and the time period between the last dose in the mother and the uh, and birth varies as well. So for many of the monoclonal antibodies, the uh, concentration ratios were similar to what we saw for endogenous IgG, where they're generally higher concentration in the newborn than the mother at birth. There are also some monoclonal antibodies where um, exposure is much more limited in the newborn. So for sertilizumab pegol, for instance, you've got very limited transfer across the placenta. This isn't surprising because sertilizumab pegol doesn't bind to FCRN, so you'd expect limited placental transfer. Vedolizumab is an IgG1 antibody, and so it's expected that it would have similar uh, transfer across the placenta to endogenous IgG. However, many uh, of the 
a mother baby pairs showed a concentration ratio of less than one. The suggestion for this was that the vedolizumab binds with high affinity to integrin receptors, which are located within the placenta. And this binding is trapping the vedolizumab in the placenta, and so it doesn't get transported across to the uh, fetus and to the, the newborn. We may also need to consider how long the, the monoclonal antibodies that have been transported into the fetus remain uh, in the newborn after birth. There are um, concerns that this could affect immune development in newborn infants, and it could also impact on when live vaccines can be administered. So there's a case study for uh, a subject or an infant who was exposed to infliximab in utero. And then unfortunately they died of disseminating BCG following their routine vaccination at three months. And this was thought to be due to the fact that they'd had the in utero exposure to infliximab. So now live vaccines are generally not given to infants who've had in utero exposure of monoclonal antibodies um, who are less than six months or even 12 months of age. So the data we uh, were able to collate from the literature as shown in the table on the right hand side. The, these uh, data are showing the length of time that monoclonal antibodies were measurable in an infant's blood uh, following birth for a range, I think it's seven monoclonal antibodies. Again, you can see in the third column that the subject numbers are very low. Many of these data are just individual case studies. Um, and also the time period between the last dose and the mother and birth varies, and this could impact how long the antibodies remain or are measurable for in the infants following birth. So there's a big range in the data um, for some antibodies uh, like tocilizumab, sertilizumab pegol, the concentrations in the infant were only measurable up to one month of age. Whereas for adalimumab, there was a case study where an infant had measurable concentrations up to 21 months of age. One um, reason that the concentrations may be measurable in infants for long periods of time could be because antibodies are also being transferred through the breast milk to uh, the newborn infants. Indeed, tocilizumab and etanercept have been found in breast milk. However, serum concentrations in infants who were exposed in utero were undetectable by four to six weeks of age, even though the mothers continued breastfeeding for much longer periods of time. And so that suggests that um, most of the monoclonal antibody that was measured in the infants came from a utero exposure, and there was very and there was limited um, transfer of the monoclonal antibodies through breastfeeding itself. So there are many advantages or opportunities for using PPK models to predict exposure and help um, design clinical trials and determine suitable dose levels in paediatric subjects or pregnant patients. In terms of pregnancy, PPK models could be used, if they were available, could be used to predict exposure in the pregnant woman. But the real advantage is that you would also be able to predict the placental transfer and the exposure in the fetus, which can't be done uh, with simpler modelling techniques. For paediatric, PPK and allometry have both been shown to perform reasonably well at predicting suitable doses in older children or adolescents. The advantage for PPK, or one of the advantages, is that you can incorporate ontogeny in PPPK and improve predictions in younger children, particularly the very young children. You can also incorporate TMDD modelling, which is um, more difficult to account for in uh, simpler techniques um, and often doesn't scale with body weight, so can't be scaled with allometry. Not only can you account for the changes in target levels or target turnover through uh, a development with um, 
age or gestation, but you can also account for differences between different disease indications with PPK modelling. As I mentioned before, the PPK models can uh, be used to account for the changing physiology during the simulated time scale. And we can um, incorporate physiological changes and different disease indications, not just uh, changes in target levels, but also other physiological changes. So the figure on the right here is from Panatal in 2020, just as an example. Um, the open circles are concentration data from young infants who've been dosed with infliximab. The black solid line is the predicted concentration when endogenous IgG levels were similar to healthy subjects. And the blue solid line is a simulated concentration profile when endogenous IgG levels were matched to those in the paediatric Kawasaki patient who had the highest measurable levels. And you can see that that change in endogenous IgG level between disease indications has had quite a big impact on the predicted exposure. And those sorts of changes can be accounted for in PPK modelling. PPK models, not just for monoclonal antibodies, but also for small uh, molecules or other biologic drugs, can be linked to PD models, allowing you to predict the effect at, uh, at the site of action and to um, assess the effect of ontogeny on the PD as well. We can harness in vitro data and preclinical data to predict exposure in uh, when clinical data are scarce and earlier on in development. Um, and we can use sensitivity analysis with PPK models to help determine the most important uh, drug specific or physiological parameters affecting exposure. And this can help us focus future research um, to determine which parameters we need to look at more closely and which data are the most important. Although there are lots of advantages of PPK, there are also currently challenges to their development, particularly for monoclonal antibodies or, or biologics. Um, one of the key challenges at the moment is the availability of ontogeny data and uh, data determining changes in the key physiological processes uh, affecting MAB exposure uh, in pregnancy. So, it can also be difficult to delineate the uh, direct effect of one physiological process on, um, it, on PK, because what we see it, when we in the clinical data is the net effect of multiple processes happening together. So many of the published PPK models for um, MAB ex predicting MAB exposure in paediatric subjects have considered ontogeny of specific processes differently. However, although data are limited in some areas where we don't have human data, we sometimes have preclinical data, which can help to inform the models. And as more data become available, they can be easily incorporated into the PPK model platforms and help us refine the predictions and um, improve prediction confidence over time. In addition to uh, the limitations of the availability of, ont of physiological data, there's also currently limited published clinical data to validate PPK models for monoclonal antibodies, um, particularly in very young infants and in pregnancy, as I showed, there's limited data there. However, just the same as the physiological data, there are data becoming available all the time. Um, also, I expect that pharmac pharmaceutical companies probably have data in house that don't become published. Um, and so as more data become available, the models can, uh, the existing models can be further validated and we can develop models for additional monoclonal antibodies, which again is going to over time increase prediction confidence. I mentioned use of in vitro data on the previous slide and um, in vitro in vivo extrapolation is commonly done in small molecule PPK modeling. Um, 
For monoclonal antibodies, the IVIVE techniques aren't as well established. Um, and so this uh, makes their use challenging at the moment. However, there is lots of lots of work going on in this area. There are many groups who are looking at correlations between in vivo clearance and things like FCRN abundance, uh, sorry, FCRN binding affinity or charge on the monoclonal antibodies or self-association of antibodies. Um, and how the in vitro data could be used to predict uh, clearance in vivo. And as more of these uh, techniques become available, uh, they can also be incorporated into PBK models to allow us to make predictions of exposure and suitable doses earlier on in clinical development. So in conclusion, uh, several PPK models have been published for monoclonal antibodies in paediatrics, and they've shown reasonable prediction accuracy across the entire age range, including newborn children and preterm infants. Unfortunately, there are no currently published models for monoclonal antibodies in pregnant women. There are many opportunities and advantages to using PPK models in paediatrics and pregnancy. Um, but the key challenge at the minute is the availability of the physiological data uh, for ontogeny and gestational changes um, and the availability of clinical data to validate the models with. But as I've said, as more of these data are becoming available all the time and it's easy to incorporate the data into the platforms that are available and to uh, validate further models. Um, which will increase prediction confidence over time. So I think that PPK models for MABs in paediatrics and pregnancy when they're available can be used to help support dose recommendations and optimise clinical trial design, along with other modelling techniques and clinical data that are available. So I'd like to thank my co-author, Dr. Hannah Jones, and also the members of the SimSit Biologics team, uh, who I've had many discussions with over the 10 years I've been here, um, especially Felix, who I'm always talking to. Um, I think I've probably overrun quite a lot, so I'll take some questions now, but if I don't get to answer them all, um, my email address is at the bottom uh, if you want to email me. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, so as Kate said, this session is now open for questions, so you can either type them into the chat or raise your hand. While people are thinking, I might ask the first question. So in, in your opinion, uh, would it be possible to develop a PPK model for pregnant women? So you, I guess that's the golden question. Um, I think that we have physiological data available for many of the processes. Um, obviously, there are areas like FCRN abundance where we're still lacking data, um, but there's quite a lot of information on endogenous IgG that could help us inform um, decisions on how to account for the missing pieces of information. Um, <clears throat> so I think that our models could be set up for pregnancy. Uh, the, I think the bigger challenge at the minute would be validating them. So there's currently plasma concentration data available for adalimumab, infliximab and vedolizumab in pregnant women. And obviously we have the concentration ratio data for more antibodies, um, but there's not, there's not a lot of data for verification uh, at the moment. But if the models were set up, then it's easy to, to incorporate new data as they become available. Thank you. Then we have a question from Kunal. Hi. Yeah, hi, thanks, Felix. Um, thanks, Kate, for this really uh, informative session. Um, my query is actually on similar uh, lines as uh, Felix. I was, uh, I was wanting to ask, and in absence of clinical data in pregnancy, I mean, what would be... Uh, uh, like a more appropriate way of using any preclinical species to uh, build or verify or gain at least some level of confidence in these models. Yeah, so I guess then we'd have to build models for the animal species as well. I haven't 
looked at whether there's physiological data available for individual animal species. Um, obviously, there are some preclinical data available and, and we would use have to use some of that in human models. But whether there's a full range of data available for rat, for instance, um, I'm not sure. Also, I'm not sure whether the placenta ex is exactly the same. So rodents, I think the placenta is different to humans. And so whether the translation from um, rat to human, for instance, would be applicable when the placenta is different, I'm not entirely certain. That's something I'd have to look at more, I'm afraid. Thank you. Do we have uh, any other question? Um, can you can you comment on data in uh, in younger children? Is there sufficient um, to to model antibodies? The, the data in younger children is more limited, um, but there are some data available. So, um, <clears throat> as I said, many of the published PPK models have incorporated verification with data from younger children. Um, there are data in preterm infants. There's also data in a uh, few day old infants or uh, certainly children under one year of age that have been used to verify uh, several of the published PPK models. Um, so the data is more limited, but there are some available. And I think over time more will become available as well in the literature. And do you have any case in the consultancy team where you got feedback from regulatories regarding the assumptions of the model? Is is there any case? Um, not that I know of at the moment. I think so we have done PPK modeling for paediatric uh, for monoclonal antibodies and the consultancy team. I believe the models that we've developed so far have been used more for internal decision making and haven't necessarily gone to the regulators or the projects haven't got to the stage of going to the regulators yet. So we haven't had uh, any feedback as yet. OK, last time for any question. That's not the case. And I'd like to thank you one more time for for your presentation. You. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And um, it's my pleasure to announce the next webinar in the series. It will happen on the 12th of April at uh, 4 p.m. UK time. Um, and it is about a uh, prediction of truck biologic interactions with cytokine modulators. Uh, so Kate will join us again together with uh, Freddie Chan and Jian Pon from, uh, from SimSip. So I'd like to uh, thank you all. Um, have a great day or a great evening. And with that, we're closing this webinar. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Thank you.